there are galaxies inside me, interstellar stars and dust. I am full of dark matter, quarks and spirals of deep love that cannot be seen with the naked eye. Hello and welcome to today's Meet the Poet. I'm Florrie Crass and today I'm going to be joined by guest poet Sue Hubbard. Sue is a art critic, a broadcaster, a novelist and most pertinently to us, a poet. She's just released her fourth poetry collection which is called Swimming to Albania and has come out with Salmon Poetry Press. Now, as the Poetry Society's only public art poet, Sue created London's largest public art poem, Eurydice, at Waterloo Station. Her poetry has been featured in many newspapers, as well as leading magazines and journals, and has even been on the radio. She's got a really interesting life to share and some wonderful poetry to discuss. If you have any questions at all, just drop them in the comment box below, and let's get started. Hello, Sue, and welcome to Meet the Poet. How are you doing today? Hi, Flory. It's lovely to be here and actually talking to you, um, because as I said, I'm so luddite about these recordings that, it, you know, I think we could use uh, two yogurt pots and a piece of string, but it's very nice to see you. It might be easier in some ways doing that, definitely. Um, well, I'm so pleased that you are here and we managed to get you on the screen and recording. Um, so let's start off just by hearing maybe how you have become a poet. Where did it all begin for you? Oh, goodness. Um, you need a long piece of string for that answer. Um, I have, I mean, as you're well aware, I'm, I'm a poet, I'm a novelist, and I'm an art critic. But it started with me being a poet. I have been writing poems since I was a child I think I think the first poem I've got somewhere that I wrote when I was about 13 at school called The Trees in Winter and actually I found it recently and it wasn't too bad and I think it really mattered to me at the time that my teacher liked it it really and so that sense of communication through writing and then I went through all the adolescent stuff that you know lots of us do of a woe is me sort of poems and then I suppose in my early 30s um, I was left with three very young children and I was writing a bit very much sort of you know, in the 70s, as women did on the kitchen table with a, no agency, really. And um, I sent a poem into the Bridport competition, and I think that got shortlisted, and that sort of encouraged me. So I joined a quite serious... I was living in the country then. I was a sort of real earth mother, you know, macrameing chickens and weaving broad beans and things. Um, and I joined a quite serious um, poetry workshop in Bath and so that was the first real engagement beyond myself with something more critical after winning you know being shortlisted fast forward and I went and um, did the MA at UEA but that that was actually to do to do prose I wanted to I was writing my first novel but my, around that time my first um, poetry collection came up when I came to London um which I did like Moose Whittington with three three tiny children on my own. Um, I couldn't go out. I was stuck. I was stuck here apart from my work, which was in those days running a stall in Portobello Road. Um, and I put an ad in Time Out and said, "Anybody want to come to a poetry workshop?" And I really got the poets of the day in my house. I mean, I wasn't running it. I wanted to share it. So I got people like Ruth Padel and Martin Crucifix and Vicky Fever and Pascal Petit. I mean, you know, really big names now. So for a long, and others as well. But so that was that first critical engagement really for me. So the genesis was much younger. But as I think I've talked with you, um, what is really important is of course the emotion, as Wordsworth said, you know, emotion recollected in tranquility. 
But for me, the tranquility is about process and the intellectual cipher which the emotional writing goes through. So that's a long-winded answer to your question. It's a fascinating answer. And, I mean, in fact, it did remind me of something that you said before, which is that you consider, your, when you talked about um, poets, you, talk, you consider yourself a romantic poet with postmodernist education. And I wondered how you, how you navigate that, you know, being a, a romantic poet in a postmodernist world. And if actually you could explain that a little bit for any of our audience members who, you know, aren't sure what you mean by that. Well, I suppose what I mean by a romantic poet is, I mean, I mentioned that I'm an art critic. So the visual world, the stimulus of the visual world is always really important to me. I think somebody reviewed one of my collections said, oh, that I was a painter monkey. I think they were being quite critical, but actually I quite liked it. I So I have a real engagement with sense of place and... I do see um, poetry as an arena in which to explore the things that the romantics explore, like the sublime, you know, loss, um, transcendence, all those sort of things. But, you know, I'm can't be Keats, even if I was good enough, I can't be, you know, and... I actually, um, having grown up on Keats, the next person that probably had the most influence on me, you know, uh, as a woman of a certain age, was Sylvia Plath. But I think what I learned from Plath, who I do return to occasionally and always astounds me, what a wonderful poet she actually is. You know, it wasn't just a youthful, oh, you know, here's a woman talking about how hard life is emotionally, which it was for me when I was young. I was left with three children at the age of 30. Um, Plath is a formalist as well. What matters is the poem. And I think what I am saying is that, you know, we go back to... T.S. Eliot and the objective correlative. The, the poem has to exist as a thing outside oneself. It can be the words worthy in emotion recollected in tranquility, but form matters. And it doesn't have to be Georgian form or modernist form. It can be a more fractured postmodern form. Of course, you know, I I write postmodern fiction, whatever that means, that the you know, there's an unreliable narrator that the different points of view, you know, the I isn't the I or whatever it is. All those things that, you know, any of us that have been involved with writing or inglit, you know, will have know about. And once you know about them, you know, it goes into the great melting pot of writing. But I think emotionally I'm probably still very attractive to how poetry can be a form of transcendence, how it can be a journey, and I don't mean that in a hippy-dippy sort of way, I mean a journey into the unconscious through which, through writing the poem, you discover the meaning, you know. Yeah. Well, um, speaking of your own poetry, you're going to be reading from your collection Swimming to Albania, which is out with Salmon Poetry Press. Um, before we hear you read from it, I wondered if, you know, you've had publications before this. How does this collection, do you think, speak to your other publications or, you know, differ from them? Uh, well, my first publication came out of th- my first poetry collection. Um, I'd had a couple of little pamphlets before that. I think in about 1994, it was, I think that was the year, when I went to UEA as a mature student, as I say, I had three small children. I went, I was living in London, I went as a mature student because I wanted to learn to write fiction. And that was my first um, collection with Enneth Arman, Everything Begins with the Skin. And I think a lot of those poems were. Um, about a complicated childhood, as many poets, even Platt, will write about, and also about, if you like, 
the romanticism of that is the right word, but the longing to get motherhood right. I had these three very small children. I was living in deep rural Somerset. You can't get more sort of romantic than that. I'm, you know, I, looking back on it now, it, it, it was not the poems was were naive, but the sense that that landscape could be so healing. But I think poetry for me has always been an exploration of deciding or discovering what I really feel and think. Um, put, you know, emotion recollected in tranquility, as, as Wordsworth said. It's, it's by the doing of it that you discover what it is that you're trying to say. You don't know necessarily until you've found the best way of saying what you didn't know you were trying to say. Yeah. Um, I think it's probably time to hear your first poem, um, and I will actually, I'll let the poem speak for itself and we can discuss the collection a bit more once you've heard it. The thing I would say is that the collection is divided into three bits. So, you know, this is my fourth collection and it deals with the loss of my parents. But having had a complicated childhood, the loss of my parents re-reflects childhood to me. So this is the first poem in the collection and it's called Lost in Space. There are galaxies inside me, interstellar stars and dust. I am full of dark matter, quarks and spirals of deep love that cannot be seen with the naked eye. Lives that might have been different under other alignments. Somewhere amid black holes and the absorption of light, beyond the mass of Milky Way, there's a distant room, the walls covered with faded flowers, a meadow of flecked sunlight, where a child lies beneath a bleached quilt in a narrow bed, dreaming of a boat with a single blue sail. A boat that will take her home. Um, thank you, Sue. It was a beautiful first poem for the collection. And I really think that it, it teases out some of the book's main preoccupations, particularly this uh, travelling and journeying that pervades the book, um, ending on, you know, that beautiful, that beautiful line, a boat that will take her home. Um, and it seems you're, throughout the book, you're looking for this home there's this feeling of being lost. And I wondered where this feeling of being lost really stems from. Uh, well, I suppose um, all poets are lost in a way or they wouldn't write, as I say. it's trying. I mean, I don't want to make too much of it, but I had a complicated, let's use that word, childhood. The notion of home, both in its most prosaic sense and its metaphorical sense and also its sort of Freudian sense um, is very important to me. The sense of finding one's place in the world, how one belongs. And that cha has changed through my life, that sense of what home means. But I think actually in thinking about it, it is actually quite a psychoanalytic poem as well, you know, this sort of swirling around and it gets smaller and smaller and small, um, more focused and goes back to that very primal thing of the child and the safety that the child craves and the, the safety that perhaps we crave all our lives as adults, but, you, you know, a tumultuous world doesn't always allow us to find it. And also the more interesting experience of life undermine it as well. So um, you can't just stay curled up as a dormouse. But, um, but there is, I think, that I'm very interested in psychoanalysis. I mean, my, um, and my thesis, um, you know, academic thesis was on Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, the ultimate uh, psychoanalytic journey. So th it, those all feed into it. So yes, the thing of being lost, you can't be lost in anything bigger than space. And to, you know, to have this end up in this little tiny 
boat that takes you home. And also, it's also, you know, all the myths of Jason and the Argonauts, all the, you know, all those myths of travelling and return. And um, the Greeks understood about that notion of the journey and the return. Gavafi lived, you know. Um, so it's all, all that. And, no. and also... Um, none of that <laughs> <laughs> can't be pinned down but there's also this um, idea of alternative possibilities and realities and you you sort of talk often talk about what could have been as you do in, in this poem a little bit like do you often think about how your life could have been yes definitely definitely I mean you know um, I'm a I'm of an age, you know, now where there's probably more life behind me than in front of me, sadly. You know, I've got grown-up children, I've got grandchildren. Um, I think, um, as I said to you, I think these are the, this is a great quote, the great poets, um, the Beatles, life is what happens when you're making other plans. Well, certainly my life is what happened when I was making other plans. And what you get left with is the life that you're, you're leading. And yes... You know, it's, um, you know, down that road we didn't take, you know, into the Rose Garden. I mean, Eliot talks about it endlessly, you know, perpetual possibility. And, of course, as one lives one's life, and if it's complicated, I brought up three children alone, and um, apart from being an art critic and a poet and... uh, now a novelist, and I ran an antique business in Portobello Ray. Um, you think, well, it's, again, it's what Elliot says, that's not what I meant at all. That's not what I meant at all, you know. And uh, But it's what you get. And I think poetry is a way of paddling your canoe to take the boat image again, you know, through that stream of consciousness to try and negotiate a way through it um, to make sense of it. Mm-hmm. I think let's hear your, your next poem, which is And Soon. Well, this, is, as I say, the book is in three parts, and the first part deals very much with the death of my parents. And this is very much about a voyage to you. I had a very complicated relationship with my father, but, um, you know, when you, and he lived till a great old age, until his 90s. But, um, you know, when you lose someone, they're gone for good. And um, the image of the boat that comes through this poem, I was doing a writing residency on the west coast of Ireland where I used to go a lot to write my novel rain songs and stuff there. A few of the poems in here are written there. And my father was dying and I wasn't sure how I could get back. It's not easy to get back from the west coast of Ireland quickly. So um, this is the, that's the genesis of this poem. And it does use not a formal rhyme, but it does use sort of internal rhyme scheme. And soon, soon it will be over. The voyage's end coming into sight like a bright spit of unmapped land as the old yule turns slowly back into harbour with its arbour of rusty fish sheds shrouded in late evening fog. The saffron light of portholes already dimmed, the tattered sails lowered, halyard and spinnakers stilled and trimmed, furled jibs lashed against the mast. A sea away, I wait on this Atlantic headland where icy galaxies keep me company in the dark and a dog fox barks in a high wet field while in those far-off Surrey hills you falter and wane. So I wish my childhood songs had not been mined in dust and pain, those black diamonds of hurt and absence. 
And now, when all that's unspoken is cinders on my tongue, I want to call out, Daddy, or my Daddy, I've been here all along, waiting across this cold, violet sea. Beautifully read, Sue, thank you. Um, a stunning poem, and in fact, one, one section of it that stuck out for me was the lines, I wish my childhood songs had not been mined in dust and pain, those black diamonds of hurt and absence. They're stunning. And I mean, maybe you've got a better explanation for them than what I have picked up on. But I mean, was your dad a miner? Is that what this reference is? No, 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 no. My, he, worked, he worked in the city, but I, um, I just had, there's, again, I suppose it's a slightly psychoanalytic image of mining, of going deeper and um, or not going deep enough in, 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 in that case. No, it's not literal at, at all, but, it, but it's that, that sense of the things that we should mine, don't mine, you know, or, um, or the darkness of the mind. So it's, it, it is an ambiguous image, you know, of the depth of the unconscious of the things that are, you know, that dark place that we, we don't quite visit and, you know, should do. It should bring it back into the light and we don't, you know. We don't, We shouldn't be down those dark mines and, you know, we should bring things into the light. But, uh, you know, for a certain generation that was less possible. Do you, I know you said that the book as a whole does reference your parents quite a lot. Do you think it's almost a tribute to them? Or is it a way to explore your childhood? They've always hovered in the background of everything that I've written, even if not physically there. Um, my first novel, which is called Depth of Field, which is about a photographer, and again, that that you know, the the, the notion of the depth of field of of a photograph is you know the perspective of how we see things, and that although that's fiction, they were borrowed in that, and this is this you know other of my collections do deal with poems about my parents, but. Both of them died while I was writing this, and that's it. And that's the, you know, whatever one's felt, so it seems to me important through poetry, or it was to me, to find a sort of tenderness of expression as well as a truthfulness without, without, um, I mean, honesty is very important, emotional and poetic honesty but it seems important to try and do that with a sort of tenderness because that that's that's it mm, absolutely and I think actually um this I mean to move on this poem links very nicely to your next poem Lake so I'll hand over to you to read that one well this poem is in a um a different um section and this poem, again, we talk about the psychoanalytic exploration. And I think, I don't want to make too much of that, but I was for a while very, very interested in, in, in sort of uh, Freudian approaches to literature. The, the, you know, what, what is nearly said, something nearly said, and this section, a lot of these were written in Ireland, different part of Ireland from my novel Rain Songs at the Tyrone Guthrie Centre, where I've been to quite often to write Anna McCary. And there's an amazing dark lake there. It's very cold, very black. Have swum in it. It's bloody freezing being Ireland. But I used to walk round it every day. And I think this poem is, again, about diving as much as anything into those really deep, dark places of the self that are painful and difficult 
that one has to explore. And the link became a metaphor, swimming, and the, the title of the book, Swimming to Albania. Um, but the link became a metaphor for that process. And um, so I'll just read it. Lake. And even with all the forgiving, the being in this moment and this, following every tilt and shift of the world, the stillness of snow, the seeping of grey dawn over the grimy sill, the curdy light of the city and its stale breathing, it's then I think of that dark lake, the trees leaning out over its black mirrored skin, fringed with purple loose strife that grows along the edge of slow moving water. The bulrushes reflected in its anthracite depths and imagine diving down and down into that icy water through duckweed and pools of green algae, water meal and water hyacinths, milfoy and hydrilla to be caught in tendrils of curly leaf pond weed. Then on, deeper still, past clasping leaf pond weed, with its thin and delicate oval shaped leaves that are wide and wavy. Coontail that lacks any true roots in the naiad and sago pond weed. To where light ceases, downwards, with this cold, seal body, towards that lost thing, that special thing, I know is there in the muddy depths, till I can no longer go on, holding my breath. Yes, thank you, Sue. I think um, one of the reasons why I said I think that leads on quite nicely from Anne soon is the idea that you mentioned of, you know, mining, discovering, diving deeper. Um, and that's exactly what this poem does. But do you think that this is a hopeless poem? I, I don't think it's any more hopeless than some of Platt's poem. And I think, um, I think the writing of a poem like this, which is quite a difficult poem to write to keep that rhythm going and the imagery going, the very act of writing it is the unhopeless bit. Um, that's the transformative bit. That's the power of poetry. Um, that, you know, that, I mean, anyone can write, sit down and say, oh, my boyfriend left me and I'm bloody miserable. But the actual process, the technical process of writing a poem becomes the redemptive part of it. And also within the body and the narrative art of uh, the collection, no, I don't think it is because the collection ends. I mean, there are lots of quiet restorative points in the collection. Some of them are ambiguous. Um, Yes, it is a dark poem, I accept that. But I think that, um, you know, unless you have the dark, you can't have the light. And uh, I think that there is a tendency within contemporary culture to want everything to be light and glitzy and to not look below the surface. And perhaps that's what I mean about being a romantic poet, um, and a post because postmodernism postmodernism is so about surface, and I am interested in depth. And you can take this depth in any way that you want. You know, self exploration or the physical diving into a lake or whatever or, or what is it ever you want or a, you know a psychic journey or what, whatever. I mean, it's ambiguous. You know, I, it 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 is what. The poem, you know, exists in relationship with the, the person who is reading it as much as the poet. So each reader will bring his, her, their own interpretation to what they're reading, their own history. And um, that's what I mean by 
postmodernist, I suppose, without, you know, I don't want to sound highfalutin, but that no narrative and as an art critic, no painting has a total authority anymore. It is, you know, there's no absolute authorial voice. You are putting something out in the in the world with as much skill as you can muster. But it's ambiguous and the the reader will bring their own history and interpretation to it. Yeah. I have to say I really appreciate your confrontation of what does lie beneath the surface. I think it is what makes your poetry so um so intriguing and um authentic. Um, and I really like what you said actually about the idea of writing poetry being redemptive. Um, so lots of interesting things to pick up. Yes, on. definitely, definitely. I mean, you know, when I've when I've run poetry workshops, obviously young poets come or beginner poets come, and they do bring, you know, oh, you know, my boyfriend left me and I'm really miserable. To, and I say, well, you know, that's a horrible feeling. I really empathise with that. But that's not the poem. You know, the postman has feelings. The job of the poet is to transform those feelings into poetry. So, okay, let's start with that. You know, I'm sorry, that's how you're feeling. But now let's use that as the pastry, the dough to make the cake. You know, that that's not the poem. You know, the being unhappy isn't the poem. It may be the ground of the poem, but... It, the transformation comes in the process of making art and, or attempting to make art. And, the, you know, and I think that's true, you know, whether you're a painter or you're, you're a poet or a novelist. I mean, of a certain sort, of a romantic in inclination, you know. I mean, not if you're an ironic postmodernist, then everything I'm saying is irrelevant. But if, if you are a sort of romantic in postmodernist sheep's clothing, then I think that that is what one is trying to do to some extent. Mm, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, and... I think it might be good to go on to your next poem, Afternoon in Siena, which is from um, the third section of your book. And now yes. each, I, I mean, each section begins with a quote, and this one begins with a quote from Henry David Thoreau, which says, not till we have lost the world do we begin to find ourselves and realise where we are. And I think well, this that's what we've been talking about. And a lot of these poems in this section were written abroad. Um, I did a residency um, I, uh, for a month in Siena. It was absolutely freezing cold, even though it was um, Easter. And I don't really speak Italian, though I do in my heart, but I don't in any useful sense. And um, I was very on my own in Siena for a month, and it was absolutely freezing. Um, so it wasn't a fun time, but gosh, I saw a lot of art. And I wrote a lot of poems. So that was one city that I was in because um, the first poem in this section is called Lost. Um, and others of the poems have been, I did another um, similar residency in a really weird outskirts of Lisbon. And it wasn't even Lisbon proper. It was on the wrong side of the river. And... Um, nothing to do there except read and write. I mean, literally nothing to do there, but one cafe. And, but, you know, talking about exploration into, you know, inner zones, that forces you to do that. So a lot of these poems have been written in places that are not home. And I think... Um, this poem is based, it's called Afternoon in Siena, and I was reading a lot, and I was rereading Cavafy, who is a poem I like very much, and he written about a room, and I sort of, this is my poem, after Cavafy, Afternoon in Siena. Soon I will know this room. It will have become familiar. Then, sometime after I've left, I'll rent it to another writer or a student, a couple on holiday for a long weekend. For now, I'll try and fix it in my mind, this ordinary room with its cold tile floor, with the outer rug, the low chair, an ugly wardrobe, 
with its foxed glass. The shuttered windows that open onto the narrow street, where in the evening a small dog yaps and yelps beneath the washing line, the purple canopy of wisteria. And in the corner, the messy bed, where in another life we might have made love, the afternoon sun bathing us in liquid light. If only I knew who you were. Um, I mean, I have to say, on what, what you said before reading the poem, the fact that these lots of these poems are written abroad and away from home really complicates this idea of how our identity is linked with place. And it's really interesting the way that you then sort of consider the temporariness of our location and how that connects to our, de- our identity in the space of this room. Um, I think it's fascinating. Well, you know, whether, whether it's the child in the boat trying in that little space or this room or galaxies, or I think it is always about negotiating a sense of belonging and how we define whether we belong, whether we can belong, whether we do belong. I think people perhaps who feel they belong are very lucky. I think perhaps many poets don't. But, um, and perhaps that is what I'm saying, that the poetry actually becomes the home. You know, that that is... He, whether it's Jason, you know, on his grand journeys or whatever it is, people have this notion of home. In the end, home is inside us. It is the process of the writing. The the poem actually gives us a home. Yes, of course, creating an atmosphere, creating a mood. I. It's very important to me that I reach and touch other people. Um, one of the essays that I, I I loved, I think it's in Bart's camera, Lucita, where he talks about the punctum, the wound, and he, he talks about it in the way like um, St. Sebastian, you know, being pierced with the spears in the side. And he, he talks about... Actually, he's talking about a visual artwork, but it's the same thing. That when you see an artwork, you know whether it's authentic, valid, good. I don't like that word. Because you feel the, uh, you feel that punctum. You feel that moment where, of identity with it. You feel the wound of the artist, the poet. And that's what I mean by touching people. So I think that that's the universalizing principle, if that's the word I can use, of moving from the personal into the universal, that you want you want the punctum, you want the stab, you want the other person to say, for that second, oh, yes, I know that. Oh, yes, yeah. I feel that. Oh, I know what that's about. Even if they, you know, even it, it's not intellectual uh, at first it may be you can go but it's that that stab that's that is very important to me you know I'm I'm not that interested in poetry that is simply clever for its own sake I mean you know there's masses of very interesting stuff that but it not what I want. I want it to be clever, but within the context of always that it, I want it to grab the reader by the throat. Or... Throughout the collection, you mention a, a you a lot. You talk to someone you, um, and you do that in this poem as well. But the you always remains ambiguous. And I wonder if that feeds into that. You know, it means it's something that everyone can then feed into and it's that ambiguity of being in the audience. Ab- absolutely. I mean, it, there are several poems that name the you. Um, it, the you is everything from the idealised love to the, um, you know, the doomed love, the lost love, to 
the mirror image of the self that one is talking to. I mean, um, there's another poem that is called You that's set on a beach that's talking almost to a doppelganger. Um, And I think the you is about idealised forms, idealised forms of romantic love, you know, that, uh, um, and, but more, more than just that, um, this part of the self that one has these conversations with as well, I think. I mean, here, obviously, it's more an idealised love, you know, I'm alone in a city, um, and there is always something insubstantial about that you just out of reach. Um, and yes, that is very much a theme. Um, I think we will head over to one of your final poems, final poems of the programme, but also of the collection. Um, this is Swimming to Albania. Yes, this is the, the, the title collection. And lots of people said, why swimming to Albania? You know, and taking it very, very literally. The genesis of this poem was, again, I was um, abroad, um, sort of on my own. Um, actually, I was doing a yoga course because I do yoga. But um, it was only yoga part of the time. And the rest of the time, I was... Um, I was in Corfu and I was reading and swimming and Corfu, as everybody knows, is opposite Albania and you can see Albania, sure. Now, I'd been to Albania maybe 30 years, not Albania, sorry, Corfu, about 30 years ago with my ex-husband when we were students. And in those days, when you looked across to Albania, you couldn't go there. It was a forbidden land. It was, you know, like this mythical place you couldn't go to because um, it was the last communist dictatorship. So you could see it sitting on the beach, sunbathing in Corfu. So this is written like 30 years later. I probably could have gone to Albania, but it still had this sense of this mythical forbidden place that you can't quite reach. And this is something that is echoed in my most recent novel, Rain Songs, where the skelligs of the Irish west coast of Ireland have that same role as a to the lighthouse, uh, Virginia Woolf's lighthouse. So these are sort of idealised places that one can't, you, you know, you, you can't quite reach the, the, the thing that you hold in your mind that, you know, you want to travel to. Anyway, that's the complicated genesis of this poem. So called Swimming to Albania. At night, the solitary moon swims outside my window, phosphorescent spangling her milky skin. Though she rides and surfs the waves, carefree as a dolphin, her body remembers how once blind night hauled her into its secret bed, feeling beneath her seaweed camisole with its tongue of shadows. But for now, she must swim alone, disorientated beneath the cloudless sky, while love points its long bone finger towards the mountains of Albania. Absolutely beautiful. I'm um, really pleased that you explained the Albania reference because I was I introduced the poem and was suddenly thinking, you know, I've got to the end of the programme without having once asked why Albania? And it's I, I really like that idea of that like, just out of reach, almost mythological land. And the, the, the impossible and the the seemingly impossible and the forbidden is what it, you know, the glimpse. It's about desire. It's a poem, you know, all about desire. I mean, you know, it's quite an erotic poem with his tongue of shadows under her seaweed camisole. So it, it is a poem about desire, but desire, you decide what the desire is.
you know, uh, the reader can decide what the desire is. But um, yeah, and those elements of desire and things that are just slightly out of reach, they filter through. I think in each poem throughout the collection, where there's you're longing for something and almost there, but just not quite. Um, well, I suppose if I, you know, I suppose if I was to sum up the collection in three words, it's longing, desire, and loss. And those are the things, whether I'm writing fiction about totally fictional characters or perhaps more intimate poetry that's perhaps closer to my own thinking, those are my themes and presumably always will be in one way or another. Um, but I think they're not just things that I've experienced. I think that, you know, they resonate with most people in some way, I mean, to a late, greater or lesser degree, you know, um, notion of loss or longing or desire. Um, and that's really what these poems are about. Mm, and also, the, you know, the letting go as well, as perhaps this last, the last poem I will read. Yes, yes. And, and last, wait, 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 I, just, I will say... Um, for everyone watching at home, that there will be links in the description to be able to purchase copies of Swimming to Albania and um, Rain Song, as you mentioned. So do go and look at those links. But um, before we move on to the final poem, I just want to say thank you so much, Sue, for joining us on Meet the Poet and sharing your story and your poetry. Um, we have... Well, thank you, Flory, for your perceptive um, questioning. Looks no problem. I absolutely nice. loved going through your poetry. I, I really, really enjoyed it. And um, I just want to take a moment to remind everyone at home that you can sign up to our poetry mailing list if you want to be notified about all events and everything poetry related like this that happens at home stage. You can also like and follow us on all of our social channels and do drop a comment for Sue in the chat box if you have any thoughts or questions on her work. I'm sure she'd like to have a look at what you all think. Of course. Um, it's always lovely to connect with readers um, as a poet. It's very rewarding. So yeah. thank you for the well, Over to you, Sue, for your final poem, Those Far Blue Hills. Well, we've been talking about journeys, and this poem actually is the only one in the collection because it takes so long to publish collection. But this one was actually written in lockdown, so the fact that it's about a journey... Um, I suppose, you know, yes, it's the final book of the poem, but it's also, again, a longing when you're locked down. And it's all the journeys in the book and that physical thing of lockdown as well. Those far blue hills. I have become a connoisseur of roads, having grown weary of anticipation, of waiting too long in the dark hours for whispered promises and midnight calls. Now I take this solitary journey down hidden byways and lanes, hauling this horse hair body towards those far blue hills and stagnant dikes, the shifting sands and impatient cities. Longing for wilderness, I've become a storyteller of absence and loss. Though all travel is a form of return as well as departure. Between barren islands and bare rocks, I trek this narrow path without losing sight of the stony shore where a white Har draws in across the purple sky, and this journey ceases. <laughs>